Yes, so you are in a different time zone. All right, well, uh, it is past that lovely hour. Um, if you are all ready, I'm gonna hand the mic over to uh, Meg and Caitlin and they will uh, start the event, so. Wonderful. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Meg Griffiths, and I'm an assistant professor of photography at TWU. And I will be your moderator, along with Caitlin Spencer, um, an MA student here at TWU. Um, the Visual Arts Division is pleased to celebrate the work that currently hangs in the East and West Gallery entitled For the Time Being a show collectively curated by visual art faculty, Caitlin Spencer and Blake Weld, um, our technical director and gallery director. The exhibition, which is up until February 18th, features prominent artists, Annette Lawrence, Bethlehem McConan, Kristen Cochran and Alicia Eggert. We are excited to facilitate this panel discussion with this group, speaking to various notions of time whether embedded in their work, working process or surfacing as a message, the works are inherently philosophical as they relate to the construct of time in unique and innovative ways. This manifests through expression reflected in the duality and multitude of experience, which encompasses the linear and circular, analog and digital, light and dark, life and death. Some works nod to the ways in which the pandemic restructured the how we record, perceive, and how time has been lost. These losses carry a sense of grief that is both personal and universal. Other times, the works reflect the phenomenological construction of the natural world as we process being a part of the whole. So I'll pass it on to Caitlin. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for being and welcome. Um, my name is Caitlin Spencer. I'm the MA candidate for the Art History and Visual Culture Program with the Visual Arts Division. And I'm the gallery assistant for the East and West Galleries in our Fine Arts Building on campus. I've had the immense pleasure um, of working with and co-curating this uh, exhibition with the Visual Arts faculty and our wonderful artists. And it's been just a pleasure to spend time with them. Um, so thank you so much for being with us tonight. I would like to begin by introducing our first two artists, Annette Lawrence and Alicia Eggert. Originally from New York, Annette Lawrence, a previous professor of the University of North Texas, lives and works in Bennington, Vermont. Her art transforms raw data into drawings, objects and installations. She addresses questions of text and image and the relationship between text and code. Her work is grounded in examining what counts, how it is counted and who is counting. Annette's process is one of making and unmaking, looking and waiting. She recognizes things that go unannounced, remain steady and continuous are unremarkable on the surface and develop meaning over time. Alicia Eckert, raised in South Africa and New Jersey, is an artist based out of Dallas, Texas, who works and teaches here in Denton at the University of North Texas. She is an interdisciplinary artist whose works give material form to language and time, the powerful but invisible forces that shape our perception. <laughs> of reality. Her creative practice is largely motivated by an existential pursuit to understand the linear and finite nature of human life within a seemingly infinite universe. And I have the pleasure of introducing Kristen Cochran and Bethlehem McConan. Kristen Cochran, originally from Portland, Oregon, is an interdisciplinary artist working in sculpture, installation, video, and print, who lives in Dallas, Texas. Her practice brings attention to the traces and residues of humans' best efforts, the tragic, tragicomic nature of human handiwork and the passage of time. 
socioeconomic disparities, workplace politics, and the relationship between basic needs and transcendent desires are metaphorically embedded in the materials that she works with. Bethlehem McConan, a native of Ethiopia, is an artist living in Austin, Texas, whose work is a continuous blending of anthropological, philosophic, and historical, both personal and collective inquiries that provides the platform for the development of the conceptual foundation of her practice. Her works in, are in photography, video, and installation, and they translate perception, presence, and place within a trans-temporal and trans-spatial topology that operates on the relational dynamics of an African diasporic consciousness. So um, I'm going to launch into some questions. Um, and I just want to remind everybody that we only have a little bit of like an hour, maybe a little bit over because we had some technical stuff going at the beginning. Um, but this question is for everyone. So feel free, whoever gets inspired. <laughs> Um, so as you know, the title for this exhibition is For the Time Being, and each of you were sought out specifically for the relationship your work has with time in various ways. I'm very curious about where this started for each of you, how this began, if you will, and um, where time as a concept is rooted in your work. Anyone jump in at any time? <laughs> I will, I guess. Um, so for me, thanks, Meg. Um, uh, for me, time is rooted in mortality, right? And so I think um, I think a lot about what we all have in common as humans um, in terms of our experience. Um, and I think we all kind of perceive and understand times and time with a capital T in different ways, um, but we all um, experience it in some way um, because of the fact that our lives are linear and finite um, by nature. You know, um, they will all come to an end eventually. Um, so I think, uh, that is really at the core of what interests me about time. Um, and I think, um, sort of the, the ultimate source of that is, um, the fact that I was raised in like a really religious family. Um, so I think, um, in religion, um, we like people talk about mortality and sort of grapple with it a lot more than I think. Um, people who aren't necessarily religious do. Um, so I think that has kind of stuck with me, even though I'm an atheist now, like constantly thinking about um, the, the finite nature of my life and um, the relationship to the kind of the broader universe um, and how also that affects my experience of the present moment. Thank you. We'll go next. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, it's interesting hearing what Alicia had to say of her association of time with mortality and the finitude of it. Um, I think, which implies kind of a, a beginning of an end, like a movement, right? A, a linear movement from a beginning to an end. And <clears throat> Conversely, for me, I'd always fought against this linearity because it did not relay or re reiterate my experience of time. Um, first of all, I always like to think about this quote that I've heard associated with Miles Davis and I have yet to personally find it as a source where he actually said this, but he said, time isn't the main thing, it's the only thing. Um, meaning all of our experiences are intertwined with time. And a lot of like self-help gurus, funny enough, use this expression because they relate it to a framework of managing and organizing time or thinking of time as a commodity not to waste. Um, but I hear it as time is everything, that everything is made of time, including ourselves. And that time is inextricable from any experience that we have. Uh, we 
are made of it, we're acting within it, and we're acting with it, right? And as an artist, I, I consider time itself as a medium that I'm using. And a lot of times, even talking with other artists who would not express that, I feel that time is a medium that they are working with as well. Um, so like the title of the show and how it flickers in between the expression of the now, of how we use it, you know, as in for the time being for an hour, for now. And also it's how you can read it as if it's for the time being, meaning for these beings that are timed, that are us really resonates with me. So just back to the fact that I travel in between what are seemingly different mediums in my work, my relationship to it is basic actually, you know, whether it's a video, photography, objects made of, of, of rocks or sand, uh, I'm seeing all of them as forms and representation of time. Thank you. Annette, would you like to say something? <laughs> sure. I started talking before, but I forgot to turn on my mic. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. This is great. And uh, I just want to build on both what Alicia and Betty was saying. And mm -hmm. when I, the way that time, I think, began in my work was um, I was always asked as a undergraduate where I was in my work because I was working with silhouettes, figures that were um, kind of abstract, you know. And um, when I realized that my body is a keeper of time, you know, as, as people who have wombs bodies tend to be, um, and I had the whole history of my menstrual cycles written down, and I was advised to keep a record in a circle. That's when time became the, the medium of my work where those two things connected text and um, the body and um, a way of, of making an account of keeping an account of being in the world. All right. Um, well, I can relate to what everyone has when I um, got interested in uh, work clothes and and um, and studio clothes and aprons and uniforms, uh, particularly ones where the surface and the seams um, relayed. Um, sort of contact and use that uh, translated to the surface, worn down surfaces or patinaed surfaces, things like this. And so, yeah, I, I kind of clued into the this, the, the interest was that this to me was sort of a second skin, which shadowed the body in, in our life in, in, mo in motion, um, particularly these garments were related to um, the effort and the movement of the body. Now, um, my body uh, in the studio, as one example, um, and how that showed up on this sort of second skin. So I think that's when I first really started um, becoming aware of my interest in time and how it how it um, how it showed up on various surfaces. Um, and I think touching on that, like the interest in quantifiable time or linear constructed time, and how you know, schedules and, um, and alarms and clocking in and clocking out and these sorts of ideas um, kind of have proof of value, proof of one's value. So it's, it's not just the linear time, but it's how it maybe relates to, um, to value and identity. Um, and then on the converse, and I can relate to what Alicia said a little bit, um, thinking about existential questions that, that might come from like a, a religious upbringing, um, perhaps, um, where I'm thinking about quantifiable now time and maybe transcendent or liberated their time. Um, so those are, those are some, some interests. Great. Caitlin. Yes. Thank you so much. I have the next question for everybody. 
Um, actually, this one's specifically directed to Kristen in Bethlehem. Uh, each of you have works that reference technology, communication, and the passage of time. Could you pick one example from the show and expound upon the relationship between these themes and your work? Sure. Um, the works I make are, the lens-based works that I make are in an intentional and continuous conversation with the history of the mechanical lens. Uh, production of photography. Um, I want to, uh, you know, I'm interested in uh, a conversation with the history of video art itself and how we wanted to court the, the failure of the technology in a lot of ways, uh, how, those seminal artists used it. And for me too, I, I see my use of lens-based technology as a misuse. I wanna misuse it to a good use. Um, I'm very much aware of the powerful influence of visual language that came through the camera, right? When you think about its inception in the 19th century, uh, it went pretty fast from being like a magical thing, you know, this ability to record, it's like confusion with the reality, to being uh, uh, a very destructive tool, right? Within like the colonial project, a way of depicting bodies and coming up with a, a taxonomy of sorts, right? Of, oh, you know, what's human, what's quasi-human, what's non-human, and that specifically in relationship to bodies like mine, it, it, it uh, created a language of pathology, right? Um, it uh, disenfranchisement in a way and uh, a loss of uh, neutral self-representation, right? So I'm thinking about all of that <clears throat> when I'm working with the lens. Um, and also, I mean, a lot of my works are also existential questions I have of living in this world, living in this body, meeting this world in this body. So um, the video work that I have in the show, um, the untitled anti-productivity exercises or moving time and space is the title. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about uh, one, I mean, the context in which I created the show was kind of, it was pre-pandemic, but in a way was almost a harbinger uh, of like the situation we are in right now. It was um, the Tito Price show um, that I made at Big Medium called Rock Standard Time, uh, which was, thinking about like rupture time, arrested time, rethinking time, a lot of the questions that we, we collectively are going through right now. Um, so in this work, um, there is a layering of time and space happening. Uh, uh, I am uh, moving the camera around, I'm using mirrors and other, uh, uh, surfaces, right, that, that create reflection. Um, there's a figure that is moving back and forth. It looks and peers into the mirrors. Uh, it is uh, in between, actually, it feels like seen between the work and the viewer. Uh, it questions an idea of, uh, I multiplied, it's not a singular figure because of all the mirrors. So, uh, there is a question of, you know, I think it was Christian who said it, of just like the here's and the there's are constantly being questioned. And uh, the multiplied figure too, who's looking upon themselves and uh, looking at the audience, right? So the gaze is constantly shifting and uh, it disempowers a fixed gaze that has a certain reading of what is happening. Uh, 
there is a multi-directional movement, um, which even in my relationship of time is something that is fundamental to me, you know, rather than again, the arrow of time that's working successively of one thing or another. I'm interested in creating or participating in the creation of language of simultaneity, of contradiction of space and time, of a folding and a bending of time, right? And that visual translation of it, uh, allowing us to be able to think in that possibility, right? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm playing with disorientation, re reorientation in a transitional time and space. Uh, the automatic focus of the camera is having a hard time to, to read what is going on and to come to a conclusion, which is important to me because that's how I think of like, of how thinking, right? The practice of thinking, right? Uh, a lot of time we, we think seeing is something that happens, but it's not, it's a practice. It is uh, like language, something that we learn, right? And uh, in these practices, right? Uh, they're anti-productive, but uh, on a deeper level, they are uh, reiterating and reinforcing a different understanding of time and space our relationship to past and future, you know, with just the layering, a simultaneity. And uh, that in itself can be reflected back again in our use of, of language. And uh, that is um, a main approach to what my practice is, affecting visual language, glitching habitual uh, expectations and ideas of what seeing is and can be, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's a good place to leave it. Thank you so much. Amazing. Okay, I'll um, I'll jump in and I, I think uh, I'll talk about, uh, there's a few works in the show that are um, these small vacuum sealed works and, um, the, I'm, I talk about them, sort of a working title for this work is called Cell, Cellular Memories. And so um, as they relate to technology, time and communication, um, I these, these began during the pandemic, uh, which is a long time ago now, um, but being quarantined in my studio, um, I had been, I had started to think about, um, the device and sort of the frame of the device, um, specifically as it relates to planned obsolescence and um, the fact that, you know, my iPhone is um, designed to fail. Um, and I started thinking maybe a, a little bit about metaphors between the phone body and the human body um, as they relate to uh, circulation of information. Um, I studied massage therapy uh, back a while back, a long while back. And I really was thinking about, I, I really, I, I love schematics and diagrams. And so when I think about um, cis body systems and sort of the linear movement of, um, of, of energy, of, of, of blood, of um, all those things in the body and how they might relate to the device and how the device, the cell phone device is made to be a handheld. And so, the, the, that org ergonomic connection um, is of interest to me and, and how there's this f information flow between um, that body and my body. Uh, that Those are some of the things I was uh, interested in. And, and uh, I think because of um, early lockdown, I just started uh, making these really crude um, reliefs that then became the, the individual cell phone cast reliefs. Um, they were embedded with artifacts that were in the studio. So bits of clothing, bits of copper, um, the materials shifted from plaster to, uh, you know, things like paraffin wax. And so these really dumb non-functioning devices were um, ways to hold memory that related to other projects in my practice. Some of the information that was embedded actually held like the DNA of the person that wore 
the, the clothing that had the tag. Um, so I, I like this idea of cellular memory as it relates to uh, finite cellular memory on a device and even the comedy of, um, of you know, phone fails and, and batteries dying and um, memory errors and things like that to, um, yeah, to cellular memory as it relates to um, our physiology and our, like how our bodies store experience in our tissue. Um, and so I don't really know a whole lot more than that, but this is the metaphor I started exploring and the objects are really um, sort of uh, slapdash and, um, and more poetic and weird than, than anything else. So uh, yeah. And I hope they're really um, like the actual object is meant to have a haptic response. They're very tactile. They're, you know, um, but they're not touchable. So anyways. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so this question is um, directed to Annette and Alicia. Your four pieces, Annette, um, entitled uh, four different ones, 375 seconds, 411 seconds, 445 seconds, and 526 seconds. And Alicia, the flower piece called Alas, um, make reference to mortality, mourning, and memorialization. Can you both talk a bit more about these ideas with us and how they arrive in your work? I know you had mentioned that before, Alicia, but I think um, what's great about these two pieces in the show is they have, um, I think, uh, such a conversation with one another. Um, can you, either one of you? I go first. Okay. Um, first, I have just quick, I wanted to say that Bethlehem's show was the last thing, one of the last things I did before the shutdown in, in March of 2020. Um, so that's really interesting that you mentioned that show and it just made me remember that. That was so, I mean, such an important marker in, in time right now. Um, and these pieces, I named them those seconds as a way of um, just counting, counting down. The, this work is a memorial to uh, George Floyd, and those are the sec the last the, well, 526 seconds was the reported time that um, the police officer kneeled on his neck. It was, turned out to be even 45 more seconds, but I just thought I would stay with the time that was most known in this work. And I was um, using as I was making the drawing of 526 seconds, I took pictures in progress, which is how the, um, those smaller numbers of seconds even exist at all. And this work was, is accumulative from like 18 months ago when I made the panels in Denton. Um, about five months ago, I drew the drawing in Bennington. And then a couple of weeks ago, I made these pieces here in, um, Pine Lake, Georgia. So it's over, you know, lots of geography and uh, a good enough amount of time. Um, the, you know, the incident sort of sparked worldwide demonstrations. Um, this work is pretty quiet in, in, you know, kind of as a contrast to all the protesting and all the, the outrage and all the, um, the outpouring of of support and, and um, concern that the event sparked. I think it just, you know, this, this is a kind of counterpoint to all of that activity. And in these drawings, I'm calling them drawings, they're, they're acrylic on um, linen. There's, there's a, a transfer, you know, there's some, something, something changes as a transition. Um, the, the black grid and the white um, stenciled shape are the same shape and they, they cross each other in these pieces. And that sense of motion or the sense of change that happens as you look at them um, is about, you know, sort of 
referencing the transition that was happening between the spirit and the body of, of George Floyd. Um, so in some ways it's very literal, in other ways it's, it's just metaphor. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, that's, that's really, um, that's really powerful in that I didn't actually know the backstory behind those works. I'm, I'm happy to know that now. Um, and, um, uh, Bethlehem, I really wish I could have seen your show in Austin, um, when I read about it. Um, yeah, it, it sounded amazing. Um, so uh, my work, I noticed that someone in the chat asked to see images. So I did pull up these two images of the work Meg asked about, if you can see those. Um, so the, the, this sculpture is called Alas, and um, it's a wall-mounted arrangement of flowers in um, obviously in the shape of the word alas. Um, and they are cut flowers um, so that uh, the work almost immediately starts to kind of wilt and die um, in the gallery. And, um, you know, over the course of the exhibition, obviously, um, the sculpture changes a lot. Um, and uh, I guess it is interesting to think about the relationship of this work to um, Annette's drawings, um, because um, one of the things that I do in my work, obviously uh, kind of time and language are the two mediums that I work with primarily. And, um, I find ways of like connecting them, um, through, uh, through like the definition or the meaning of the words that I'm using and the, and the, um, behavior of the materials. And, um, so like together, there's some sort of like combination of those things that, um, hopefully becomes like more than the sum of its parts. Right. Um, but the definition, so, I, so I'm so i interested, um, obviously I, I think and I read a lot about time and whether or not it's a construct or, um, you know, whether it's linear or cyclical, um, you know, finite or infinite, all the things. Um, I love to read about um, time from the perspective of like physics um, and relativity and those kinds of theories, but also philosophy um, and thinking about the potential for there to be like multiple kind of time universes or each of us living in our own kind of universe of time. Um, but I, I'm always on the hunt for like materials um, that actually have a sense of time embedded in them naturally so that the work itself um, changes over time. It isn't just about time, like it actually physically materializes time. Um, and I'm interested in the way that different materials have different durations naturally. Um, so like the difference between a cut flower and how long um, it takes to wilt and die and maybe drop its petals versus um, you know, like a carved stone and how long it would take a word to, um, you know, kind of disappear out of the surface of a stone um, if it was exposed to the elements for however long. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, and I also think about like the way that those durations change our own experience of the work, um, whether or not we're actually able to perceive like whether our like physical limitations in our own bodies allow us to physically perceive change, um, uh, whether like we can perceive it in the moment or we have to kind of revisit a work over longer periods of time in order to actually perceive that change. Um, but in this case, um, I knew I wanted to make a sculpture out of cut flowers that said something. And um, actually, uh, originally, one of the words I was exploring working with was the word always. And I was um, 
I actually love my mother's cursive handwriting. And so I was asking her to kind of like write the word always in her beautiful cursive. And I was exploring using that for this uh, piece in flowers. And then a, a, a friend of mine actually said like, oh, that reminds me of maxi pads. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, um, so I decided not to use the word always. And I was, <laughs> I was kind of like thinking about other, um, other words that I could use with this material. And um, somehow I, I, I had a conversation with a friend about the word alas and how beautiful it is and how kind of like old fashioned it is. And ultimately when I, when I start to consider using words in my work, even words like now and then, which I think I know the definitions to, um, one of my first, the, one of the first steps in my process as an artist is to actually just look up the definition of, of everyday words in the dictionary. And the word alas, um, is an exclamation, uh, an expression of grief, pity, or concern. Um, so circling back to Annette's work and those two pieces being in the same space, like, obviously there's a power to that, like the grief and, you know, the concern and the anguish of, you know, George Floyd's last 500 and something seconds, right? 546. I can't remember how many it was. Um, but, and then the, the, the grief expressed, um, by these flowers actually dying on the wall across the room. Um, I'm now that I realize that these two things exist in the same space, I'm, I'm really blown away. Um, uh, I think the only other thing that I would say about this work is that, um, each time it's exhibited, it's exhibited with fresh flowers, um, at the very beginning of the exhibition. And I actually hire a floral arranger to arrange them. So um, up until now, I've always used the same person, Penny Halcyon. And, um, but the, the flowers are always dependent on um, the actual time of year and the location and the, like what is actually um, accessible in terms of, um, you know, uh, flora in that area at that moment in time. So. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. So beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, how are we on time? 641. Pretty good. Okay. Uh, all right. So we have another question, but this is open to anyone. Um, so how does the body, and I think you touched upon, oh, so many of you have actually touched upon the body um, in relationship um, with your work in reference to time. Many of the works have a conversation with ideas surrounding relaxation and I think even meditation, either in the practice of the making and it becomes meditative or um, the actual way in which uh, I think the viewer experiences it as a, a meditation as well in viewing or repeating the words um, that are written or um, the repetitive nature of certain objects. And I think of that as a meditation too. So. Um, this is open um, to anyone and all of you. I would love to hear everything you have to say. I'll go first. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you with what everyone has said. I mean, there's just so much resonance in this um, grouping that I'm so grateful for because um, I am familiar with the work of um, Annette Lawrence, and I've had the beautiful opportunity of having personal exchanges with her about works, but uh, Alicia and Kristen, I wasn't very familiar, and uh, hearing you talk um, has connected me to your work in a deep way, um, lots of resonance, um, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, and I'm thankful to the curatorial team that thought about putting the show together. Um, um, it's really beautiful. Um, and one of the things that excites me about this grouping is that um, it could be said that we all make uh, abstract work, right? That expression. But uh, it's really wonderful that, um, you know, I, I, I think of my work operating with an abstraction to 
but uh, this is a conversation I've had with Annette before. I mean, I think of it as a, uh, I like to think of it as grounded abstraction, an abstraction that considers the body and uh, personal experiences and history and doesn't negate them or believe that you can exist outside of them. And hearing both everyone talk, uh, I sense that in each of your practices. And uh, so, like Alicia said, my, my work comes from uh, existential questions that arise from my my experience of the world, right? And uh, I am, I tend to focus on history's haunt on the present. And uh, like I said before, the lenses, be it biological or mechanical, uh, dominant role as a means through which uh, perception is primarily constructed. Um, and I'm interested in intersecting that with uh, a specific body, right? And for me, as a, a diaspora and Ethiopian, right? Earlier, we were talking about our personal experiences of time. For me, as an Ethiopian, I come with a very uh, particular experience of time uh, in the sense that in Ethiopia, we operate with a different calendar, completely different calendar than the rest of the world. Um, our New Year celebrated in September, the second week of September, and we are seven years behind, if you want to look at it that way, to the rest of the world. Um, we have 13 months as opposed to 12 months. Uh, and so when, and we count time in a different way because we're closer to the equator. So pretty much have equal uh, night and day. So we start the day by one, you know, so the equivalent of 7 a.m. everywhere else is 1 a.m. for us and then continues on, um, you know, so like my passport when I was born has my birthday in the sixties, you know, so I'm older than my life partner in my Ethiopian life, because he was born in 68. Uh, so just this navigating of different times is uh, from my, just my foundational upbringing was there and the questions then immigrating to the West, uh, just, you know, just that diasporic, diasporic mentality I'm talk, talking about of, you know, that your experience, your interior time is also on different times, right? So I'm here, but my mother is in another time zone all the time, right? Because uh, she didn't immigrate with me. Or me and my siblings are scattered all over the world also in these different time zones. So I was never, this body was not fixed in a particular time nor space. There's just inherent mobility. Uh, and uh, uh, like Alicia was saying earlier, a duration of like a time not as this line that is just passing in front of me, but like something I'm inside of, right? That I can enter and even entering, it is constantly moving, right? So um, the work that I make is considering the body as that, as, as, as mobile and not fixed. Um, and again, trying to using uh, uh, mediums that have this semblance of movement within them, speaking about time, the way that I've identified them, right? Be it, again, the, 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 be it rocks, you know, be it sand, or be it uh, photographs that I'm not considering still or film moving. Um, and in terms of the meditative aspect to always, uh, I mean, I approach the less is more in my practice. So uh, the almost skeletal, skeletal minimum needed 
uh, actions and touches to uh, realize that communication. Um, and that communication being a, a, a body and a reality that is in a constant state of, un, of, of becoming and trying to remain uncaptured and free. Um, leave it at that. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. I'll, I'll jump in real quick and just talk about um, like a meditative, maybe an absurd, absurdly uh, meditative act. Um, some of the work that is in, um, I can't remember which gallery it is, but the 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 word search text based work, um, it, it be it's it's this attempt to um, it's this attempt to quantify time and space uh, through language um, that is a standing in for the atmospheric reality uh and maybe perceptual reality of the sun rising and the sun setting and during um during this you know specifically like the the lockdown times of the pandemic where um my sense of time was really disoriented not just mine but um where it kind of felt ups upside down or inverted or and so as it relates to sort of relaxation or meditation i'm not sure I think that, that there was a desire for this like repetitive act to try to locate, like read sunrise and read sunset in the, in these scattered letters and then, um, and then circle them uh, as an act of like locating myself in space. Um, it, it, it was like aimed at maybe something that would be relaxing, but but you all know that I just kept going, right? I just kept going and going and going. And so it never, I never felt like um, it really was meditative, but, uh, but it definitely was repetitive. Um, yeah. Thank you. And that, or Alicia, would you like to answer that? Or? I'll jump in. Um, I think that the way that I work could actually be um, characterized as meditative because it's, it's real slow and um, it's very repetitive and, you know, it's very, it, it is kind of a Zen activity to draw circles and then fill in little boxes, you know, <laughs> for hours and hours and hours. Um, and as it relates to this work, I was thinking, you know, this, this, the, the impetus of this work is an act of violence, like a really a gross act of violence um, to, with, with two bodies, you know, one body perpetrating this violence on another one. And then, you know, until, until one spirit leaves a body, it's really, um, there's so much there, there's so much uh, existential, stuff wrapped up in that, that, um, I mean, it's an awful circumstance to be existential, but it's, it's like the ultimate existential thing. Um, so just specifically about, about the work in the show, I think I was able to kind of process my own grief around what happened uh, through these works. And uh, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily relaxing, but I would say yes, meditative. Yeah. I'll just pass the mic to Alicia. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> um, my work, my process is not meditative in the least bit. <laughs> I feel like um, I long for. Uh, it's actually something it's it's actually something that's a goal of mine right now is um like I had this epiphany recently that all my work is about time and you know about like um you know the sort of 
the different experience of time in terms of like short term and like long term and deep time. Um, but I, I am like, it's my process is really fast paced um, and very conceptual, obviously. Um, and there, I actually haven't really done anything that um, comes into being over a long period of time right, um, is like a long-term project. And so that is something that I'm aiming for now. So the little uh, drawing that I have in the show of the pile of rocks, um, I can see if I can pull it up, but um, it's called All the Moments Before and After Now. Um, so it's this idea that I had of um, creating an installation um, of, uh, rocks like that that have been carved with the word then um, so each rock has the word then carved into its surface and and then all of these rocks have been made into this giant pile and uh, the reason for the word then is I'm kind of fascinated by this word because it can refer to both like the past and the future. Um, so to me, it's it's literally any other moment besides now. <laughs> um, and so uh, so I have I have this vision, right, of, of actually doing this project, and I've tried to apply for several grants to fund it, but um, all of those applications have been unsuccessful. So um, I. Um, I've decided like, I need to learn how to carve the rocks myself and finally do like a, a really long-term project where I can just like slowly collect and carve these rocks over a really long period of time. And it'll be sort of a lifelong accumulation. Um, and so that is my goal for this year. And I'm really excited to actually have a process that I can, kind of return to as like a, as like a medication or med medication, meditation, or like uh, sort of like uh, grounding, like literally, um, I guess, you know, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I'm really excited um, to start that project. I plan on learning how to um, car carve sometime this year. Um, and it turns out I've done some research and found a person who I've been, learning about the process and it's interesting to learn that carving a letter or a word into stone is much different than carving sculpturally um, because you have to like you have to have a, a, a much um, you know you have to have knowledge in typography um, so so that process is actually called letter cutting um, and so I'm excited to learn how to cut letters um, but I think What's interesting for me is that I actually make work, even though I don't make work in a meditative sort of way, I do make work that actually allows other people to have meditative experiences in the act of viewing. Um, so whether it's, you know, kind of like, uh, like flashing neon signs, having a really rhythmic um, sort of um, motion and a sort of like beckoning or, um, you know, just that idea that like you can watch something happen over and over and over again at a sort of like slow and steady pace. Or, um, you know, when I filmed the word forever appearing dis and disappearing in the fog, it's like the rhythmic sort of like fog horns and that kind of slow reveal of the word over time. Um, so I love to give that experience to other people. So I'm excited to actually give it to myself. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, it's interesting to hear um, that take too, because I feel like so much of the work, um, even if the underbelly of it uh, is not meditative, or even hearing that the practice is not meditative, it actually gives the um, sort of like breath experience of like breathing. I feel like that and a number of the pieces that are in the show, which I feel like is meditation. Um, okay, so we have run out of time for our prepared questions, but we do have 70 people here, I mean, including all of us, who are probably really curious. And I know there's already a question in the chat. Um, so if someone, okay, let's find that question. I know it was, uh, 
somebody out there had a question. I know. Oh, yes. Uh, I believe it is Sam Cress. And it said, on the subject of time, has there been a certain time slash era that has affected your work in particular? Anyone like to take a... I'll do it. <laughs> um, this, this moment, I think, is, is the answer to that question. I, no, for me, anyway. Um, it's been, it, you know, there is no going back to what we all know, you know, we're going forward and it's going to be strange. It's going to continue to be strange. Um, so work is, my work is coming from, from the, the many things that have just happened this year. Um, and I, I can't say more about that, but I do want to say something about abstraction because all of us are working in an abstract way, but we're working with things that are very representational, very recognizable, you know? Um, and I just love that, the play of that, like the way we think about abstraction as being less understandable, say, than a representation of something. Uh, but the things that we're using, all of us are using, are identifiable and nameable and knowable. You know, it's just the way we use them is, uh, you know, causes you causes one to make different kinds of connections. And so, so I don't see abstraction and representation. I would say they are treated as as these um, diametrically opposed things. Um, they are so, so the same. There's so much not that, you know. I just wanted to say that because, because you mentioned abstraction. So great. Please feel free to put um, a question in the chat. Um, anyone else out there, we would love to be able to give you the opportunity to hear them speak in response to something you found interesting in the show or a uh, curiosity of yours in terms of time or space or body, any of these things um, they've all been talking about. I also wanted to kind of um, taxi what Annette just said about this current time that we're living in. Um, what's amazing in my experience of it is how it has ruptured kind of these divisions of time. So. I too can say that this is a marking time on my work because of how it has connected me to all times in my life. You know, I had thought that my initial immigration to the US at nine years old were kind of considering where I came from a, a kind of an isolated place that experienced modernity and colonialism in a very specific and different way because of its role in history. Uh, and just being a young person that felt like they were, went to another planet rather than another country. Uh, that's what I had initially thought of as a marking uh, effect on what I do, how I think of the world, who I am, who I became, who I'm becoming. But this moment now has just a, that kind of a fault breaking uh, effect on me. And it also collapses that other time into it too. Um, and all of us, I think have just been, the gift of this crisis is we've been forced to slow down and to pay attention, well, not pay, give attention. Uh, and reorient and restructure ourselves of, with what is most important to us and filtering out what is not to just be given this opportunity and to know that there is no returning to any kind of normal or what was before. And that in a lot of ways, thank God for that. Um, it's just an opportunity to participate in something new for ourselves and collectively for the world. So in that way, I feel like that is 
this time is a huge effect on my practice, even though I had been practicing for a while. I love that the way you put that. It's an opportunity. It's wonderful. Well, um, if there are no more questions, does anybody else want to um, speak about uh, anything on the topic? <laughs> I want to give everybody space. Oh, we do have a question. A question um, for Annette. Um, from Giovanni Valdez, my colleague. Uh, in your 1992 work, Rock Writing, which was a commentary on social justice issues. Is, so that's the question. Oh, I, I can't see the question. Is oh, there? okay. How has time, I don't know if it's, if that, writing which has commentary on social justice issues how mm -hmm. has time we don't know if there's another part of that i'm sorry geo well I, I, thank you for that question geo the, the, that piece is on view right now at the um museum of fine arts in houston and i wouldn't have known it except that giovanni sent me a picture and told me that it was up so um thank you for that um, but that piece was, I made that in response to, um, oh God, I'm not going to think of his name, the, the incident of the, uh, in Los Angeles where the police beat the guy up, Rodney King, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the jury found the cops not guilty, which ignited, you know, all pandemonium. I made it, I made this piece with the words, they must don't know who we are. It's um, about six feet by four feet on the floor. And it just has those words written in um, black rocks and surrounded by white rocks. It was just black and white. And it's a temporary piece. It, those, those rocks get packed up in boxes when they're not installed. So calling it rock writing uh, playing around with something written in stone and that's temporal, just messing around. Um, but also that that phrase is commonly used, you know, and it applies to so many things. And I was playing with the idea that, um, you know, that they ought to know better, you know, the, the they and that. And, and we, the we can be, can be anybody. You know, it could be women, it could be black people, it could be, you know, just you name it. Um, so that's, that's that piece. It's yeah, I, I think uh, it was slow typing on his end, but he said, how has time affected the piece? Um, and in terms of your perception of issues today, so um, in this moment in time, I think is what he's saying, like contextually, that piece, you know, that was 1992, that was Rodney King. And now we're, we're, we are in a somewhat different place, but in some ways not. And so I think maybe that's what he's trying to get at. Yeah, it, it's proving to be a timeless piece, right? It's, it's, it's applicable through, you know, from the, all these years. Um, it's one of my mother's favorite things I've ever made. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it seems like, you know, it would be nice if, if that phrase lost its power, if it was no longer applicable, but it, it still is. Yeah, most definitely. Are there any other issues or uh, questions out there? Okay, I'll give it one more second. I hate to go. This has been such an amazing experience. I'm like I don't want to. I don't want to get off the Zoom. Um, well, I uh, I I just hope. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you to um, the exhibition and lecture committee and all the faculty and, of course, Caitlin and Blake um, for uh, bringing uh, all of these artists together. And we we did studio visits and we poured over websites and talked extensively about these pieces that ended up in the show. And I just wanna thank you all um, artists. I'm, I'm so uh, grateful. This has been 
an incredible panel, actually, if I do say so uh, myself. Um, and I'm just, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been really moving and touching and um, I know it's going to be really impactful for our students. So I thank you. Thank you for your time and your labor and energy and doing your work and um, there's a whole list of all kinds of things people are saying on this side in things. Um, very excited. Thank you. Thank you, curators and sellers. Thank you. Incredible work. Thank you so much meeting these great artists. So what fun enjoying their work and their talk. Such a perfect collection of time based works. Incredible. Lots of clapping. Agreed wholeheartedly. All of that. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to you, Meg. And thanks, Caitlin. Um, really great job to the, you know, congratulations to the curatorial team, because this is such an honor to to be here with with, um, with this group of artists that I like so admire. Huge honor. Thank you. So the same way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's great meeting everyone, seeing everyone's faces. Yes. Yeah. I wish it was in person. I yeah, know. me too. That would this is the only wonderful. thing. Yeah, yeah, I wish. Yeah. Um, it, we, now I, we all we all get to go and enjoy the work in this new in this new like ether of what you've provided for us, which is really amazing. And how will this, will this recording be available for, for folks? Uh, I believe Blake uh, might know more about that, but I hope so. I would like to watch it over again and over <laughs> again and to share it with our students. I mean, really quite amazing. Uh, I don't think, at least since I've been at TW, we haven't had anything like this before, so. It's very okay. exciting. Yeah. I see, yeah. I see in the chat, it's going to be on YouTube. So. On YouTube. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Very good. I'll send people awesome. to see it. Thank you guys so much. It's been such an honor to meet you and spend time with you and learn from you. I had to hold back tears like several times just through this talk. It was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. thank you, Caitlin. Yep, thank you, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. Everybody be warm in this crazy weather. Yeah. And take care of yourselves. What an honor. I hope I hope we can all be in the same space. I, I, I'm wondering if that's possible. We so, are already in a way, but it'd this be is, nice yeah. if we were there in our bodies as well. This is, yeah. Yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank take you so care, much. Everyone. I'm glad it worked. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Take care too.